Uh, yes. Put it on the side, yes. Okay, very good. Um, yeah, so I will present some work, uh, um, a few works, um, done in collaboration with various uh, various people. Uh, almost all of them are here. Andrea Antinucci, Giovanni Galati, Giovanni Rizzi, they are students at CISA, Galati moving to Brussels, Christian Copetti, a postdoc in CISA, moving to Oxford. Uh, Jeremia Saganera Damia, Riccardo Argurio, Luigi Tizzano in Brussels, and uh, uh, Sergio Benvenuti in Sissa. Uh, yes, and one of those work that I will present uh, will, uh, in fact, appear on, on Thursday. Uh, hopefully, I will have time to, to get there. Let's see. So since I'm the first uh, speaker of the conference, I will take the liberty of introducing a few concepts. Uh, probably most of you are very familiar with these concepts, so I apologize for that. Uh, but maybe not all of you are, so this might be useful. And I'm sure this concept will appear uh, repeatedly in this, in this conference. Um, also, this is a field that has become very technical. Um, and in fact, this is a conference with both uh, mathematicians and physicists. I'm a physicist. So probably we will say things that are not uh, uh, completely precise or maybe completely wrong. So in that case, I encourage you to interrupt me and help me to uh, rectify um, some statements. Yeah, unfortunately, the first uh, line, but I'll wait. Where do I put it? Oh, good place. Ah, OK. Maybe not. <laughs> Okay, very good. So, uh, so the topic of this talk, and in fact, the topic of the of the conference is generalized symmetries. This is a very interesting and powerful new paradigm for symmetries, and it says that in fact we should regard symmetries in Euclidean uh, quantum field theory uh, everything that is a topological de facto operator of any dimension, and uh, the standard zero form symmetries corresponding to a group G fit into this uh, framework. Uh, for each element of the group, there is uh, one codimension one defect along some submanifold, which is essentially a domain wall. Uh, these defects can fuse according to the group structure. Uh, so this is the group multiplication law. And the fact that the charges conserve translates into the fact that uh, these defects are topological, so they can be moved in correlation functions as long as they don't cross some other operator. Uh, the basic example is of a U1 symmetry. In this case, uh, we take the conserved current, we integrate it, we get the charge, and then the exponential of the charge is the unitary operator that implements the symmetry on the Hilbert space. And uh, once again, the conservation of the charge gives that this operator is uh, um, topological. However, here I will only consider discrete or uh, even better, finite symmetries, not continuous. Now this uh, paradigm, not working anymore. Oh, let me see. Okay, good. So with this paradigm, we introduce various new structure into symmetries. So first of all, we can have the facts of higher codimension. Uh, this corresponds to P-forms, and the objects that are charged under these symmetries are extended operators, and the charges are measured by linking. Besides, we can have symmetries that act on other symmetries, uh, and they can give rise to two groups, or more generally, N groups. In fact, in the standard case, we have some local operator and some defect for a zero-form symmetry. When the operator goes through the defect is transformed according to some representation of the group into the transformed operator. But now suppose that we have some uh, higher form symmetry, for instance, in three dimensions, if you have one form symmetries, we have lines. Now also the lines can go through these defects and get transformed. And so now we have the action of symmetries on other symmetries. However, they have different dimensionality. And so they do not just form a non-abelian group, but they form some other algebraic structure, which is a two group or an N group. Uh, besides, we can have a fusion algebras instead of just uh, group multiplication law. So when we fuse together two objects, we don't just get one, but we get sum of various objects in terms of coefficients. And in fact, 
when we go to dimension which is higher than two or three, these coefficients become uh, uh, not just numbers, but uh, uh, partition functions of some topological quantum field theory. And so uh, this object here depend on the manifold where we have the fusion of these, of these defects. Um, finally, we can have symmetries that are obtained by condensing higher other symmetries. So we can take a symmetry and we can gauge it not in the whole of space time, but just on a submanifold. And this produces new topological objects, so new symmetries. Now, if you are in two dimensions, uh, the most general structure is well understood. Of course, most general comes with a big footnote because, uh, well, we have to be in a bosonic quantum field theory, discuss discrete or better finite symmetries, no space-time action, and so on. If you go beyond that, uh, well, everything is not so well understood. Um, but OK, in this case, the uh, framework is, is the one of uh, fusion mm -hmm. categories. So there are some objects. These are, uh, roughly speaking, the, the line defects. It is a tensor product that corresponds to stacking the lines. Uh, there are morphisms that correspond to this fusion algebra. So how we map uh, a tensor product of, of lines into some other lines. Uh, and then there are other data, for instance, the associator of the F symbol that essentially allows us to do some moves when we have uh, uh, fusions of, of these defects. Uh, and of course, this, this framework includes the standard case of a zero form symmetry G with an atoft anomaly, and the atoft anomaly is described by this associator, but this is general. Um, now, in two dimensions, why things are, are simpler? Well, perhaps one reason is that in D dimensions, only up to D minus two form symmetries are non trivial. So, in two dimensions, we only have zero form symmetries, uh, while when we go to higher uh, dimension, we have more types of, of symmetries. Uh, besides, another important uh, uh, tool that uh, will appear is that the structure of these fusion categories that represent 2D objects are equivalently described by certain uh, modular tensor categories. Uh, these are some 3D objects. Uh, this is the Dreamfeld center of this fusion category. And in fact, this is related to a concept that I will introduce in a, in a minute, which is the concept of symmetry TFT. But I'm sure that this will, uh, so I will roughly explain it, but this will be explained much better in, in other talks. Now, when we go to higher dimension, in fact, we have a more complicated structure because we should work with D minus one category. And uh, uh, so what is roughly speaking an N category? Well, this is uh, some structure in which there are objects. These are the zero form symmetry defects. There are one morphisms between these objects. These are the junctions of the zero form symmetry defects. Uh, but then there are two morphisms between the one morphisms. So here there are arrows between arrows. These will be the junctions of junctions and so on. So there is a more complicated structure. And uh, uh, this is, um, studied a lot in mathematics, and there are many different definitions of these categories, many different properties or assumptions that one could make. And uh, I would say it's fair to say it's not completely clear which precise mathematical definition uh, is the one that should appear in physics, should correspond to a uh, quantum field theory. So of course, in mathematics, we can define things in many different ways, but it's not yet clear which one fits the physical problem. And also, it's not yet uh, uh, clear how to quantify all the pieces of data that enter into the definition of an N category. These are defined maybe abstractly as uh, in terms of morphisms, but in physics, we need to quantify things, uh, present some basis, quantify things such that we can, in specific example, list uh, um, precisely what are the pieces of data and the relations that we're dealing with. And this is, of course, a topic of uh, active research. So um, in higher dimensions, uh, by now we have various examples of these more uh, general uh, symmetries that go under the name of categorical symmetries, like in the uh, name of the Simons collaboration or uh, non-invertible symmetries. Uh, but roughly speaking, there are three um, types of examples, so if you want three categories of examples. Uh, so one is constructed in the following way. You start with a theory with a higher form symmetry, but also a zero form symmetry that acts on it. Uh, one example is uh, SUN Young-Mills with uh, some uh, that has a ZN one form symmetry. Uh, 
Uh, and here there is also a charge conjugation that acts on the generators of the one point symmetry. These are surfaces. Uh, and now you can you can try to gauge this charge conjugation. Now, before the gauging, this is an abelian symmetry. So the, the defects fuse according to the uh, abelian group law. But when you gauge, the objects that survive are conjugation classes. So in particular, there are the sum of two objects. And now if you make the fusion, you get that here you find after the gauging the sum of two objects. So in fact, you get a non-invertible uh, symmetry. Another class of examples uh, is obtained by taking some four-dimensional theory with a U1 symmetry, which has an uh, ABJ anomaly. Um, so some U1. Now, because of the ABJ anomaly, the current is not conserved, and one would say that the symmetry is destroyed. But in fact, a non-invertible version of the symmetry survives, in which only the rational numbers, the rational points in U1 survive. And this is constructed essentially taking the non-conserved current but in integrating it, but putting it together with uh, uh, some quantum whole states that is coupled to the background and uh, essentially cancel the non-conservation. Uh, non uh, finally, there is another class of examples, which is self-duality symmetries. So in fact, this class of example will be the, uh, the, the focus of my talk. So I will explain this better uh, later, but let me just say a basic example, at least for a physicist, this is a very simple example. Uh, take n equal four super young males, four dimensions, with gauge group SUN. Now, this theory is an S-duality. You can try to go to a self-dual uh, point of this S-duality, so the gauge coupling, the complexified gauge coupling equal to I. Now, this is almost self-dual, but not quite, because the self-duality changes uh, the gauge group. Uh, but in fact, there exists a non-invertible version of this that makes it into a non-invertible uh, symmetry. And uh, I will explain this better in the following. So here I will not go into uh, too many details. OK, so uh, now um, I would like to present some, some questions that for me are natural and that uh, I will try to address in this, in this talk. So one question is, can we understand the structure of the symmetry? Uh, as I described, this should be some sort of fusion category as opposed to a group, so it requires more data than just a group. Uh, and in particular, given a concrete example, can we identify all the pieces of data that specify this fusion category? And as I described, this is particularly difficult in higher dimensions because we are dealing with a D minus one category uh, and the full set of required data is not known. And also it depends a little bit on when, what definition you use for this category. Another set of questions has to do with anomalies. Uh, we know in physics, anomalies are a very powerful tool, essentially because they are renormalization group invariant, they are topological, and so they are exactly calculable uh, observables, which in quantum field theory is quite a rare thing. Uh, and besides, because they are invariant under energy flow, that gives constraints on the dynamics of the theory. This is particularly useful uh, if a theory goes to strong coupling. Uh, now, the standard anomalies, say anomalies for invertible symmetries, are quantified by an integer or some integer, some number. Uh, in fact, they are elements of some cohomology group. Uh, for instance, if you have an internal zero form symmetry G, this will be some element of group cohomology, uh, or more generally, will be some cobordings group. But all these groups are abelian. And so, uh, in fact, you can, uh, these are essentially numbers. Uh, besides, since these are abelian groups, uh, you have the standard anomalies are additive. So you can always try to cancel an anomaly by adding matter to a theory, or maybe uh, combining different theories such that the total anomaly vanishes, and then when it vanishes, you can gauge the, uh, di the, the diagonal part of the group. Now, for non-invertible symmetries, how to associate numbers to anomalies is not known. And in fact, it's not even obvious that it's possible to associate numbers because it's not obvious that these anomalies are additive. So it's not obvious that you can just combine theories and cancel it. So one question is to understand what is the structure of, of anomalies. Um, and in fact, I might say that it's not even obvious how to define anomalies mm -hmm. Uh, because I remind you that for standard continuous um, symmetries, for example, zero form symmetry, what you do is that you take some quantum field theory, you couple it to background fields for this symmetry, 
uh, and you compute a, a partition function. And then you try to do a gauge transformation for the background field. And what you might discover is that, in fact, the partition function is not invariant under gauge transformation, but picks up a phase, which is a local integral of some local function of the gauge parameter and of, the, of these background fields. Uh, now, if you go to discrete symmetries as opposed to continuous, uh, well, it's a little bit more complicated because uh, now you have discrete groups. So either you can try to use discrete background fields or you can, instead of using background fields, you can use a network of defects. So you can represent a given background in terms of a network of defects, which is inserted on your uh, Euclidean space-time manifold. And then the gauge transformations that maintain the bundle will correspond to some set of moves that you can do in this, in this, in this network. And then the anomalies would appear as some phases that are picked up when you do these moves. But when we go to non-invertible symmetries, uh, it's not clear what a bundle is for a non-invertible symmetry because we don't have a group. Uh, it's not clear what a background field is. Uh, we could try to use this definition in terms of networks, but then you have to tell me what is the set of moves that I'm allowed to do, and then maybe I can try to see what phases I get when I do this, this move. So it's not clear how to define anomalies. And a possible definition uh, that I will use, this is just a yes or no definition. It does not quantify the anomaly, but at least tries to answer the question whether there is an anomaly or not, is that uh, there is an anomaly if the symmetry cannot be gauged. So this is a partial answer, does not quantify the anomalies, uh, but is something that maybe is more, more um, uh, at reach. Uh, finally, uh, another question that we can have is, um, okay, if we have a theory with some non-invertible symmetry, how does this symmetry appear in holography? And this question is very much related to the previous one. Because the standard law in holography is that when you have a, a global symmetry on the boundary, we have a gauge field in the bulk. Um, however, if you have a non-invertible symmetry, what, what is the gauge field in the bulk? Once again, we don't have a bundle, we don't have a group. So how do we, uh, what is a gauge field for a non-invertible symmetry? And in fact, uh, the answer seems to be very, very much related to this concept uh, of the symmetry TFT. So in some sense, we do have a gauge field, but the gauge field, uh, at least for discrete symmetries, uh, is we can think of it as the symmetry TFT. Uh, let, uh, let me see. So let me say uh, with my words, what is the symmetry TFT? I think we will have more precise talks on this. So if one, this is very superficial, but uh, my, my take on it is the following. So um, suppose you start with some theory in D dimensions which has some, uh, for instance, invertible and, and discrete symmetry uh, G and then some Toft anomaly, then we know that this theory should live, if you want to turn on a background, should live at the boundary of an invertible TQFT. So in this matter, this is called an SP, uh, symmetry protected topological phase. Uh, for this symmetry, well, the, the invertible TQFT has some symmetry G and this captures the anomaly and we can call it the anomaly TFT. Now, suppose that part of this symmetry is anomaly free. Uh, now you can, some, some part H, you can try to gauge it. And by doing it, you produce a new theory that I can call uh, T mod H. And this theory will have a new symmetry because the gauge symmetry disappears, but the new dual symmetry appear, appears, and there will be a new anomaly and so on. However, these discrete gaugings do not introduce new dynamics into the theory. They do not introduce new physical degrees of freedom. Yeah. Uh, they are topological, they don't, do not depend on the RG scale. Um, and so what they do is that they just reshuffle the physical information between twisted and untwisted sectors. But all the same physical information is there. And in fact, one can keep doing it. So once you gauge once, you can gauge another time. You can construct a net of, of theories. All of them contains the same physical information. It's just reshuffled in different ways in the untwisted and twisted sectors. And so one can try to uplift or upgrade this SPT phase to a full-fledged non-invertible TQFT such that there exists a particular topological boundary conditions that reproduces the original SPT, uh, but there might be other topological boundary conditions uh, and 
any of them would correspond to a possible gauging of the boundary theory. Uh, and so as you explore the space of topological boundary conditions, in fact, you explore the space of all possible boundary theories that contains the same physical informations. And in this framework, an anomaly, which is an obstruction to gauging, would appear as a lack of a boundary condition. So the fact that, for instance, you have a unique boundary condition tell you that there is no gauging in the boundary that you can do. And so the boundary theory is fully anomalous. And of course, this is very superficial. This symmetry TFT contains uh, much more information, but mm -hmm. let me uh, leave it like, uh, like this. Okay, so after this long introduction, this leads me to uh, the plan of my talk. So in this talk, as I said, I will focus on a particular case of non-invert uh, class of non-invertible mm -hmm. symmetries, which is self-duality symmetries. So I will explain in a little bit more details what they are. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then the first question that I will uh, address is how these symmetries appear in holography in the specific example of uh, four dimensional and equal force mills. Then I will briefly mention the question of uh, um, how is it possible to deform these, uh, these, uh, these theories in such a way that the symmetry is preserved and so study symmetries along RG flows. And in fact, uh, Luigi Tizzano will have a talk on this. So we'll just mention a few things if you wish advertising his, his talk. And then type permitting, I will say a few things about a uh, work uh, to appear on Thursday about uh, anomalies of self-dual symmetries. Uh, there is also a poster of uh, Andrea uh, here and also in the afternoon, there will be a, a talk by Poshen. Uh, we have coordinated submission with them, so they, they, they will also have a paper on this. Okay, any question? Okay. So uh, let me talk about self duality symmetries. So the simple example that I want to consider is four-dimensional n equal four superior means with gauge algebra SUN. Now, given this gauge algebra, there can be many different uh, uh, gauge groups that one can have. This uh, we can call global variants. So we can have SUN, we can have PSUN, which is SUN divided by the center. Uh, and in fact, there are some discrete theta angles that one can associate to these, uh, to these theories that are labeled by this index P. Uh, or we can have other gauge groups where we divide by other divisors of n. Now, this theory enjoys uh, S-duality, or SL to Z S-duality, and in particular, the S elements maps uh, the uh, complexified gauge coupling tau to one minus uh, one over tau, but it also acts on the uh, global variant, on, on the gauge group mapping SUN to PSUN. Now we can try to make this S duality into a symmetry. Uh, generically, this just tells us the two different theories, quantum mechanically are the same theory. Um, so we can tune the gauge coupling to be at a self-dual point, tau equal to i, but yet the theory doesn't go exactly to itself because SUN is mapped to PSUN. So it's still a duality, it's still not a, a, a symmetry. However, we can correct this with some topological operation. So the SUN theory has a ZN electric one form symmetry. This corresponds to shifting the gauge field by uh, the center of the, of the gauge group. Uh, and this one form symmetry measures the anality of Wilson line operators. And what happens is that if you gauge this one form symmetry, you obtain the PSUN theory. And likewise, the PSUN theory is a ZN magnetic one form symmetry uh, related to the pi one. And if you gauge it, we go back to SUN. So uh, gauging allows us to move between SUN and PSUN. So now what you can do is to combine S duality with this topological gauging in such a way that the theory is mapped to itself and then S duality becomes a symmetry. So here you start with SUN, you put an interface, an S duality interface, the PSUN theory, but then on this half space, you gauge the magnetic one form symmetry so you get back SUN. So now you have that on both sides of these defects, you have the same theory. Besides, this defect is topological because when you do this uh, discrete gauging, this is a topological operation. And so you can move these defects and the correlation functions do not change. And so this uh, proves that this is topological and so this is a symmetry. 
But in fact, it turns out that this is a non-invertible symmetry, zero form symmetry. And one way to, to see that, the simplest way, is to consider the product of the, uh, the fact for S with uh, its inverse, that here is the uh, orientation reversal. So if you do that, essentially you create this slab in the middle where you have the gauging of the one font symmetry. But now since this is topological, you can squash them. And what you obtain is a gauging of the one font symmetry just on this three dimensional surface. Uh, and in fact, this is a higher gauging of the one font symmetry is called a condensate. So what you get here is not the identity, some other operator is this condensate. And in fact, it turns out that there is no operator that multiplied by US give you the identity. And so this is a non-invertible symmetry. Uh, there is a similar story for the other invariant point in SL2Z, which is this point here, which is invariant under a triality symmetry. Uh, and other similar examples can be considered, for instance, in, my, in a free Maxwell theory um, and so on. Now, the question that I would like to address is, uh, uh, well, this is a theory for which we have a holographic dual. The holographic dual is typed to be string theory on ADS5 cross S5. How does this non-invertible symmetry appear um, in the bulk, in the holographic context, and how the non-invertibility appears from the holographic description? So of course we know how uh, S duality uh, corresponds in the bulk. There is an SL to Z S duality uh, of uh, type to be string theory and in particular supergravity where the action is on the axio dilaton constructed out of the dilaton and of the, on the Ramon Ramon the zero form potential. However, as we saw this global variance, the global structure of the group plays a very important ro role in uh, figuring out that the symmetry is, is not invertible. And so the first step is to understand how these global variants appear from the point of view of the bulk. And this is a problem that has been understood long ago. Uh, essentially, there is a topological sector in type to be um, string theory and supergravity that follows from this Chen Simon's coupling in supergravity. If you compactify it on S5, uh, there are n units of flux for S5. So you get this action here. And in fact, this action here, which is a sort of Chen Simons-like action, is also the Lagrangian description of a five-dimensional two-form ZN gauge theory. This is a topological theory. The following, I can also use this notation in which I put together B2 and C2, which has the Ramon Ramon um, two-form potentials of uh, type to be string theory and uh, uh, as a vector and just use this compact notation. So now how uh, do we choose uh, the gauge group on the boundary, well, in holography, you have to specify boundary conditions for all the fields in the bulk. And so in particular, we have to specify boundary condition for this topological sector. For instance, we can ch ch choose electric boundary, topological boundary conditions. We set B2 to zero at the boundary. And if you do that, we get the SUN theory. We could choose magnetic topological boundary condition and set C2 to zero. This gives us the PSUN theory. And in fact, one can consider more general mixed topological boundary condition. And this allows us to create all the various global variants that depending on N, uh, the theory can, can have. Uh, in fact, there is also a non-topological but conformal boundary condition one can choose. And for instance, this gives us the UN theory, but I will not discuss this, uh, this here. Okay, so now we have this S duality. And in the bulk, S, S duality, SL to Z, uh, S duality appears as a gauge theory. Yes. Uh, you repeat the question. Well, because there is a star. Uh, so this is the Hodge dual, and this requires the metric. Uh, it does not require the full knowledge of the metric. So this is conformal, it's invariant under the scaling, uh, but it's not topological. Well, this, you don't need the metric to write this. It's just a pullback. Uh, if you wish, it's similar to the fact that uh, 3D Chen Simon's theory uh, at the boundary, there is a conformal field theory that lives because you don't use topology. If you don't use topological boundary condition, but use the uh, holomorphic boundary conditions. Any other question? Okay, so, so, so in gravity, there are no global symmetries. So this SL2Z uh, should be thought of as gauge theory. 
However, uh, this is usually spontaneously broken by the fact that there is an expectation value for the axiodilaton. And so we usually, you, we usually don't talk about this, uh, this, this, gauge, this gauge field. Uh, and in fact, this, uh, uh, this group here uh, acts on uh, this five-dimensional uh, two-form gauge theory. Uh, however, if you go at special points, so special values of tau, part of this gauge, gauge theory will be unbroken, in particular tau equal to i, a z4 is unbroken because there is also a charge conjugation, which is the square of s, which is always unbroken. Uh, and at this point here, there will be a, a z6, which is unbroken. And so uh, the theory, the topological theory that we have in the bulk is not just this five-dimensional zn gauge theory, but in fact is a gauge version of it where you do a further gauging by z4 of z6 of this five-dimensional gauge theory. And in fact, it turns out that this particular five-dimensional TQFT is the symmetry TFT for this, uh, for this example, for this four-dimensional theory, or at least for the, for the symmetry that this four-dimensional theory has. So what I would like to consider here is SUN with the case that N is odd prime, and this is the case that we studied in the, in the paper and uh, it technically simplifies a lot of things. So in particular, what I would like to show is how to obtain the defects that corresponds to these S duality defects at the boundary and how these non-invertible structures appear, the fact that you get these condensates. So, uh, so let me try to, to get there. So one starts with the ungauge theory, so one can start studying this uh, five-dimensional TQFT, uh, this gauge theory. Uh, this has Zn times Zn, a two-form symmetry, because in the Lagrangian there are two two-form gauge fields, if you wish. Uh, this is represented by surface symmetry defects uh, that are generated by integrals of B2 and, and C2. Now, as I said, this theory also has a cell to Zn symmetry that acts on it. And so there should be defects, could I mention one defects for it? And in fact, there are, this can be constructed as condensation defects of this two-fourth symmetry. In other words, you take a four-dimensional submanifold, and on this four-dimensional submanifold, you gauge the, uh, this two-form symmetry, or possibly a subgroup of it, and possibly with discrete torsion. And in fact, if you study the possible subgroups and discrete torsion, you realize that there are exactly as many as the elements of this group here. Um, and then you can also try to study the fusion of these defects uh, using this language of uh, higher gauging and you reproduce the uh, fusion, the, the group law of SL to Z. Now, just to give you an example, if you take some elements of SL to uh, Zn with this property that the trace of M is not two, then they come from condensing the full uh, to form uh, symmetry with a particular torsion, discrete torsion, I can represent this torsion by a two by two symmetric matrix. If, if I think of this as a two component vector, uh, then uh, this uh, distortion is quadratic. Uh, and so it's given by a two by two symmetric matrix. Uh, and the matrix is, is in here. For instance, for S, you use this particular torsion. For C, the torsion is zero. While for the generator T, uh, you have to use, uh, it's not in this class because the trace of, uh, the trace of M is two. So you have to gauge a subgroup. Um, you can also have a Lagrangian description of this uh, uh, higher gauging, essentially because gauging the two for symmetry on a submanifold can be done by integrating uh, the two form gauge fields on some submanifold or the four manifold. And this can be done in terms of the Poincare dual using some field. So one can write a Lagrangian uh, in terms of it. And this Lagrangian contains the discrete torsion. Now, one useful piece of information is that whenever this matrix T is invertible, it turns out that the four-dimensional TQFT is invertible. Um, and I will, here for simplicity, I will mostly consider this case here. Uh, and so in particular, this means that we can think of this, uh, of the theory on the defect as the SPT, uh, the anomaly inflow action for some other theory. Yes. This is uh, uh, an invertible TQFT, it's an SPT phase. So you can study the lines in this theory and they are, uh, they are trivial. 
uh, if you wish, you can integrate out exactly the fields and this just becomes a phase uh, for this. So this phi, gamma, psi are four dimensional fields. This B is the five dimensional background. It turns out you can integrate them out and just get uh, the Pontryagin square. The, you can obtain B, uh, T minus one, B. So it's a uh, SPT phase for, uh, for B, which is a five dimensional field. Okay, so now we have these twist defects. Uh, and it turns out that these twist defects admit boundaries. So there are three dimensional boundaries for these defects. And one would like to know what is the theory that lives on this boundary. Uh, one way is to use the Lagrangian that I presented before, or perhaps more simply, you can say since the four dimensional T, T, T was invertible, was an SPT phase, then the theory that lives on the boundary should be a theory that has the anomaly that cancels the anomalies of this anomaly info action. So this is the thing that I said before, right? This is the B, T minus one B. And it turns out that this is uh, a theory which uh, uh, these people call the minimal 3D TQFT or modular tensor category. This is a minimal theory that realizes uh, the anomaly given by this matrix T. Okay, so these four dimensional uh, defects can have a boundary. The boundary is three dimensional. On this three dimensional boundary, there is a theory that lives. And now one would like to do fusion. So if you have the four dimensional defects and we do fusion, we, get, we just get the group law of SL to Z. But when we, go the when we do the fusion of these boundaries, we get something more interesting. And this can be understood in various ways. Um, and uh, uh, if you want one interesting fact is that the five dimensional bulk contribute. So when you put these defects together and you fuse them, they're not just stuck together as the coupled systems, but in fact, they couple through the bulk. And one way to understand is the following. So this three-dimensional theory has lines, um, and then there are the lines of the two theories, but these lines really, they are endpoints of surfaces in the bulk, and the surfaces in the bulk, like I'm, I'm trying to represent here, and the surfaces in the bulk have braiding. So the lines on this three-dimensional theory, when you put them together, they get a braiding, from the fact that the surfaces have a braiding in five dimensions. So this allows to introduce a sort of twisted product. It's a product, uh, a tensor product that is twisted by the bulk. Uh, and if you work out this product of uh, two uh, such uh, defect theories, you get another defect theory. In fact, you get the defect for the correct uh, SL2Z element. So this tau one two is correctly the tower that represents the product of the SL2Z elements, uh, but there is an extra factor in front. There is some extra TQFT that appears here. Uh, and so this allows to produce this uh, multiplication law for uh, uh, these three-dimensional defects. So we are almost there. We already get some, some pre-factors here, some coefficients which are TQFTs. There is one last step to do, and this has to do with the fact that, of course, we have to uh, move this object to the boundary because we have to put topological boundary conditions. And at the end of the day, these three-dimensional defects will be the three-dimensional defects uh, of the boundary theory uh, that are co-dimension one. So they correspond to a zero form symmetry of the, of the boundary. Uh, and so you have to project uh, these things uh, according to the boundary conditions. Now, these projections is a certain Dirichlet boundary conditions for this B, as I said before, for instance, the electric boundary condition sets B2 to zero, or the magnetic boundary condition sets C2 to zero. And so when you do that, uh, out of this theory here, a piece of it, since some, a piece of B is set to zero, a piece of, B, uh, of it decouples, and this BL is the part that is in B that is set to zero, and this can be dropped consistently. And so you are left with a smaller theory that couples the gauge fields that are not projected out at the boundary. And it turns out that this procedure of dropping these pieces here is consistent with the fusion. And what you're left with is, in fact, the fusion rules um, that appear in the boundary um, in terms of some topological field theory. And in the paper, we have explicit formulas for what this theory is. I'm not writing them here because they're just some ugly formulas, but they're, they're, they're very explicit. So this allows to obtain these, these, these fusion rules. And for instance, applying it to some special cases, 
So if we consider a product of two defects where the torsion matrix is the opposite, this corresponds to the fact that the defects are the inverse uh, one of the other, we don't just get the identity, but we get a condensate. And for instance, if we take the product of 2S, we don't just get C, uh, when the torsion is zero, this should be C, the charge conjugation, but we get a condensate in front. So uh, in other words, we exactly reproduce the uh, fusion, uh, uh, the fusion um, laws, the non-invertible fusion laws that uh, uh, were computed from the point of view of the boundary. Uh, now, there is one last uh, step that one should really do. One should gauge the appropriate subgroup of SL to Z. So far, I didn't do this gauging. Uh, but in fact, what happens when you do this gauging is precisely the four-dimensional surfaces that you gauge, they become transparent. Uh, if you have a three-dimensional boundary, really it becomes a Google with an operator because now you have a monodromy yeah. for, for the gauge field. Uh, and so, strictly speaking, one should talk about this product of the uh, boundary theory, this three-dimensional boundary theory that I described, and the Google Witten operator. They both have an anomaly, but in fact, together, the anomaly cancel. And this is the operator that can only live uh, at the boundary. It becomes the uh, non-invertible operator in the boundary theory. And so the fusion rules are the one that I presented before, and they reproduce the, uh, what was computed before in the field theory. So these are the first results. Um, let me make two comments. So one comment is that these SL2Z defects that we are using uh, in supergravity, in fact, they are nothing else than seven brains because uh, uh, in fact, a uh, seven brain is precisely a codimension two locus where as you go around, there is a monodromy for the axiodilaton. So you can reinterpret these defects in the full string theory as seven brains because they are not D seven brains, they are more general seven brains. Uh, and, uh, and one can use the full power of string theory yeah. to study the properties from the point of view of the theories living on seven brains. One comment. Uh, the other comment is that uh, uh, this holographic construction can be extended to more complicated theories, for instance, class S. Uh, this is a class of theories for which we don't have a Lagrangian description. And so the description in terms of the bulk is particularly useful. And for instance, this has been used uh, by, by um, these collaborators of mine in a paper. Uh, and in fact, the result has also been obtained by uh, slightly different methods by this, uh, this other group. Yes. people can hear. So uh, just a, um, our, uh, quick question about the seven brain. These uh, more general seven brains, I guess, are PQ, PQ seven brains or what? And if uh, yes, so, uh, what PAQ are related to in terms of the theory you are talking about? So the, the PQ7 brains are bound states of PQ7 brains that have constant axiodiloton profile. So one will support, say, E6 gauge theory. Another will support, say, E7 gauge theory. So uh, I'll, I'll briefly mention it in my talk. But, uh, OK. Thanks. <laughs> Any other question? OK. So uh, the next thing that I would like to briefly address, as I said, this is more a teaser uh, because uh, Luigi will have a talk on this, is uh, um, so if we have a theory with non-invertible symmetry, some CFT with non-invertible symmetry, um, can we consider the formations of this theory that preserve the symmetry? Uh, the presence of the symmetry is going to give us some constraints on the dynamics. For instance, it prevents the generation of symmetry breaking operators. It can also give us constraints on the low energy theory, uh, in particular in the presence of anomalies. But what these constraints are uh, might depend on what is the infrared phase. In particular, we may or may not have spontaneous symmetry breaking. So how do we construct the formations that preserve non-invertible symmetries in this example? Well, a starting point is the action of a cell to Z on operators. So this also has been understood long ago. It turns out that the operators can be assigned a charge Q under modular transformations. Uh, they, um, once we diagonalize the operators according to this charge, they're transformed in this, in this way uh, with some phase. Uh, for instance, with this particular definition of, uh, of uh, um, 
as duality, the scalars of n equal force Bernoulli mills are neutral. They do not transform. The fermions and the supercharges have charge one. And for instance, the gauge fields can be organized in a combination that has charge two. Now, if you go to a self-dual point where tau is invariant, uh, then this becomes just a phase. Um, and this is the transformation, for instance, of the supercharges that have charge one and all the other operators transform in a similar way. Now, what class of deformation can we study? Well, of course, we can try to study many different types of deformations. Um, a natural class is to deform by a superpotential. And a very simple superpotential is just giving masses to the scalars, uh, the adjoint scalars of n equal four superior meals. Um, now, when we study that, the topological gauging which is involved in S does not uh, uh, does not uh, uh, create problem because it does not act on local operators. However, it turns out that the superpotential should not be should have a definite charge under modular transformations in such a way to get an invariant Lagrangian, essentially because the superpotential is integrated over the over the super coordinates of, of superspace. Uh, but the scalars are invariant. So we cannot just take literally this action that I presented before. One has to combine with a su suitable R symmetry rotation. Mm. This can be done. One can produce a combination of S duality symmetry with R symmetry uh, that leaves these uh, uh, terms invariant. And then one can study various types of examples depending on, for instance, how many masses are different from zero. For instance, in some examples, in the equal one star theory. This is a theory with gap vacua or free photons. One can obtain the n equal two star theory. This is an n equal two theory. So there is a Coulomb branch uh, or there is uh, giving mass to just one of them. Uh, one obtains the least raster CFT. So this is a, a, a n equal one CFT. So let me just consider one simple case. As I said, there's a teaser. Uh, the case of the n equal one star theory. We give masses to all the uh, three adjoints, complex adjoints. And it turns out that there are various vacua. This vacua can be gapped or have free photons. Uh, but for simplicity, let me just consider the case of SU2. SU2 is particularly simple. There are only three vacua. They are all gapped. There are no vacua with free photons. One is a X vacuum. Essentially, the, the three scalar fields get a VEV. The bay, they, they break the gauge group. However, the gauge is not broken completely uh, because they're in the adjoint. So there is a Z2 that survives. And in this vacuum, there is a Z2 gauge theory. In fact, since there is a, uh, since this is a Higgs vacuum, the Wilson line that here I, I indicate in this way because it tells electric charge and not magnetic charge, the Wilson line condenses. But the Wilson line is a genuine, uh, is a genuine line operator in this theory. Uh, and so the fact that it condenses uh, means that one form symmetry is broken. Uh, and so once again, we are led to the fact that there should be a TQFT, which is uh, uh, in some sense, the Goldstone mode of this broken one form symmetry. On the other hand, there are two confined vacua. Uh, in this vacua, the, the scalars are zero. Uh, so essentially we go back to n equal to one superior mills and this theory confines and has two vacua. Uh, um, called C0 and C1. And in these two vacua, in one, there is the Toft line that condenses. In the other one is the Dion that condenses. However, these are not genuine lines in this theory. Uh, only the Wilson lines are. The Toft line has to be the end point of a surface. And because of that, there is no spontaneous breaking of the one from symmetry. And in fact, what they get is an SPT. So these are trivially uh, gapped vacua. Uh, with a slightly different SPT phase, which is related to a mixed anomaly. Now, what happens is that if we now look at the action of S duality on this theory, it turns out that the X vacuum is mapped to the confining, one of the confining vacua, but the other confining vacuum is a singlet. For instance, this can be checked using an order parameter um, for the breaking of this, uh, an order parameter for, uh, yes, for the breaking of the non-invertible symmetry. So what we obtain is the perhaps uh, surprising, or perhaps not, I don't know, result that the spontaneous breaking of a non-invertible symmetry produces the generate vacua 
which have inequivalent physical properties because one of them is a two gauge theory. The other one instead is a trivially gapped vacuum. So uh, this is perhaps uh, surprising, but in fact, it has to do with the fact that non-invertible symmetries relates twisted and untwisted sectors. So for instance, here, you start with a Wilson line, you move it on the other side, it should become a Toft line. Uh, however, the Toft line, as I said, is not a genuine line operator in the theory. It has to be attached to a surface. And so in fact, you map vacua on one side, there is a Z2 gauge theory, but on the other side, where this condenses, it's just an SPT phase. Uh, so this is summarizing this table. The fact these two vacua are uh, followed, the degeneracy of these two vacua follows from spontaneous breaking. It's interesting to look at another global form of the same theory, which is the PSU2-1 theory, because this global form is left invariant under rest duality. So in order to construct the um, S-duality symmetry, you don't, do not need the topological operation. So the S-duality is invertible, in this example, and in fact, if you look at the operators, well, the, the two vacua that are related by S duality, now they have the same physical property. They are both uh, trivially gapped. So when the symmetry is invertible, it behaves in the, st in the standard way. When it's non-invertible, it's slightly more interesting. Okay, there are other things that can be discussed, but this uh, uh, I think will be covered in uh, Luigi's talk. Any question on this? Okay, so if not, let me move uh, uh, very quickly to the last uh, topic, which is trying to understand anomalies of self-duality symmetries. As I explained, the definition that I, want, that I want to use is that a symmetry is anomalous if it cannot be gauged. But of course, in order to use this definition, one needs a precise definition of, the, of, of what the N category is, that describes the symmetry of the quantum theory, and also a precise definition of what gauging is, because now we have to deal with these non-invertible symmetries. And uh, um, in two dimensions, this is understood, but the higher dimensions, this is not yet fully understood. So it seems difficult, uh, well, at least, uh, it's, um, but now it's difficult to try to apply the strategy. And so our strategy was, uh, and this is the word that will appear on Thursday, uh, start in two dimensions, when in fact the, the tools are well understood and the problem is solved, rephrase uh, the solution in terms of the symmetry TFT of this three-dimensional theory. And now it turns out that the result is a natural generalization to 4D. And so now propose, make a proposal for 4D that can, for instance, can be studied in examples and hopefully in the future will be checked against the fully categorical um, de definition of the problem. So very quickly, one starts in two dimensions with a theory which has a self-duality, and the basic example is the Ising CFT. Uh, this is a theory that has a Z2 symmetry, which is generated by a line, but also it has Kramer's Barnier self-duality. This is self-duality under gauging of this Z2 symmetry. And this N is non-invertible because when we take the product to itself, we don't get just the identity. This is a Z2 because of self-duality, but we have this sum. In fact, it turns out that this system here is a generalization in which instead of having a Z2 symmetry, you can have a more general non-anomalous uh, abelian symmetry, A. And uh, the, the fusion category that describes it is called the Tambara Yamagami uh, category. This category depends on some data uh, besides the group A. It depends on a symmetric non-degenerate B character on A. Essentially, this fixes the F symbols. Uh, or equivalently tells us if we have the, uh, the symmetry defect N and we end lines on both sides, now we get points. And if we try to commute these points, we get a phase. This phase is described by this gamma. This will be, have a generalization to four dimensions. And besides, there is a, a Frobenius sure indicator, a plus minus sign, which encodes the F symbol of N. And uh, um, this also will have a counterpart in four dimensions. So now the strategy is the following. As I said, one asks, okay, can we do, uh, can we gauge, uh, can we perform a gauging that involves 
uh, this non-invertible defect, and because of lack of time, let me cut the, the details. However, as I say, this problem has been solved, and there are some conditions for the gauging that involved uh, that involve uh, uh, which subgroup of the invertible symmetry is also involved in the gauging, so some subgroup B, and which discrete torsion is used to gauge it. And there are some abstractions that have been written down that we call the first and the second abstraction. So what we did was to reinterpret, or if you want to translate these two abstractions in terms of the three-dimensional uh, symmetry TFT. Three-dimensional uh, symmetry TFT is very similar to the one that I described before in five dimensions. There is a diagraph with N theory for A. This is just a 3D gauge theory. On this theory, there is um, this theory is a one phone symmetry made of two factors, A and the Pontragian dual of A. And then there is uh, a Z2 automorphism that act on it, that we call phi, and one has to gauge it uh, in order to obtain the symmetry TFT. So it's some 3D gauge theory further gauged by a zero phone symmetry that acts on it. So now I can ask, uh, OK, what are the topological boundary conditions of this theory? And uh, um, it turns out, so let me just give you the result, that the previous known abstraction can be rewritten in this language. First of all, there must be a duality invariant Lagrangian algebra in the diagraph with N theory. Now it turns out that the Lagrangian algebras in diagraph with N theory can be classified by a subgroup of this A and uh, a, a class, a torsion class, that can be rewritten in terms of an alternating B character on B. And now the conditions for the, uh, the first abstraction can be rewritten as the condition that these Lagrangian algebras are duality invariant, so are invariant under this duality that acts on the diagraph with N theory. This is the first abstraction. Now, if this Lagrangian algebra, which is duality invariant, exists, one can gauge it. Since this is Lagrangian, the diagraph with N theory becomes completely trivial. Uh, however, since it is invariant under, under G, uh, the Z2, what we get is an SP2 for, for Z2 that we should gauge. But of course, we can gauge it only if this SPT is trivial. Otherwise, there is an anomaly. And uh, uh, one should compute uh, the SPT phase that you obtain from this gauging, that we call Y, this has to be combined with the epsilon, uh, this Frobenius sure indicator that can be thought of as an SPT for Z2, and only if uh, they cancel each other, um, then this can be gauged, and in fact, this turns out to be equivalent to the second abstraction. So this is a description of the anomaly that has a natural generalization to four dimensions. This is what we did. In four dimensions, we have a one form symmetry and a theory that is invariant under gauging this one form symmetry. There is also this symmetric B character. This time comes from braiding on these three dimensional defects as before, because there are the surfaces of, uh, uh, of, uh, um, of these uh, uh, one form sy symmetry defects. They end as lines these defects and the braiding of these lines gives us the symmetric B character. And also there is a cubic anomaly, epsilon, for this uh, self-duality, uh, thinking of it as, a, as an invertible defect. And so, okay, once again, cutting the details because of lack of time, one can write down similar abstractions. The first abstraction will involve, it will be some algebraic conditions on the subgroup of A, and on a certain class that can be rewritten in terms of a symmetric time as opposed to anti-symmetric B character on B. Uh, and the second abstraction instead can be written in terms of computing the SPT phase that you obtain uh, from uh, the fact that there exists a duality invariant Lagrangian algebra, and we have a simple formula for it, and requiring that this SPT exactly cancel uh, against epsilon. Um, now, I didn't have time to um, explain this very uh, well because of lack of time, but we tested this in some examples, and for instance, it matches uh, the, the information that was known by this example. Well, let me conclude. Uh, so what I did was to discuss various aspects of self-duality symmetries, in particular the structure, how they can be obtained from holography, the type of dynamics that they can lead to along RG flows, and uh, um, how to describe at least part of their anomalies. Now, of course, self-duality symmetry is just one example, 
it will be very interesting to extend these discussions to more general non-invertible symmetries. Uh, and of course, all of these at the end of the day should fit into the correct definition of a D minus one category that fits the physical situation. Uh, uh, well, as we know, the community or part of the community is moving in that direction. So hopefully uh, very soon we will obtain this uh, result. So thank you for your attention. Uh, you mentioned in the starting of your talk that there are various uh, uh, different definitions of higher categories and it's not clear which one is the right one to use. So I think in the recent years, a lot of this has been clarified. Uh, so for example, if you look at fusion two categories, there is a paper by Douglas and Reuter which sets out clearly what the, the full definition should be. And then Theo has extended this to fusion higher categories. And the, yeah, but when you go to three categories, for instance, it's not uh, the situation. I would say I would say it's fair to say it's not it's not as as clear as for two categories. One second, what is the correct definition that should match uh, the, the the symmetries of of a quantum field theory? Yeah, uh, I mean there are some subtleties like there are infinite number of simple objects, etc. But I think the there is a well well defined definition by Theo and others. Uh, that one can use to do concrete calculations, et cetera. Of course, so there are uh, well-defined definitions. I'm not saying that there are no definitions. I would say that it's not clear exactly which definition exactly matches the okay. physical situation. Uh, as I said, the fact that in mathematics, you can have many different well-defined or consistent definitions, mm -hmm. uh, but in order to address the physical problem, uh, it's not completely clear, at least for three Okay. It seems you have something in mind, so let's discuss uh, later. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. yeah. But for sure, this is a very active uh, topic of research, and uh, uh, the community is moving in that direction. So, yes. Can you hear me? Can I add a follow up to this? Uh, no, I cannot. Uh, I mean, I can hear, but not distinguishing the words. Okay. I'll type them. Maybe you can try to. Yeah. Ah, the chat, the chat. Yes. I mean, maybe if you shout, I can, I can understand. So the question is in your stream. This classifies the Lagrangians. So yes, so. So as I said, so this is not this is not a mathematical proof. Uh, so in 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 two and three dimensions, this is a mathematical proof. So the problem in two dimensions has been solved in the language of fusion categories and then in their language. So the abstractions are known. And what we did was to rephrase the very same. Sorry, let me just uh, try to answer. Um, so we rephrase the, the, those conditions in terms, in, in some other terms that uh, physically are uh, more easily generalizable to higher dimensions. So the fact that there must exist uh, uh, duality invariant, Lagrangian algebra in the diagram within theory, and then the fact that when you gauge it, you get an SPT that cancels with the Frobenius Schur indicator. Now, in four dimension, we don't have a mathematical proof, once again, because we are not starting with the precise definition of the three category and what it means to gauging in the three category. Um, what we did was to propose the generalization. Um, okay, I'm not sure. So, okay, just to finish, what I want to say is that uh, we give a proposal for what the answer should be in four dimensions, but as I said, it's not mathematical proof. Uh, but are you talking about the Lagrangian uh, algebra in the diagram written theory or in the full gauge theory? Maybe this discussion should continue a bit. Yes. 
Yes. So I have another question. So usually there are um, two, so far there are at least uh, two definitions of anomalies. So one is that, as you mentioned, obstruction to gauging, and the other is the incompatibility, incompatible with SPT phases. Uh, in 2D, uh, there's a paper by Shu Heng and his collaborator show that these two notions are not completely equivalent. Uh, so, yes, here too, use? they are not uh, equivalent. Uh, and in fact, you can find examples in which you can gauge the symmetry. They are not gauging the full, so it might be that they are equivalent if you gauge both the non invertible defects and the full invertible part. This would be the full Tambara Yamagami fusion category in, in two dimensions. But the point is that you can also try to gauge just a, a subgroup of, of the invertible part. Uh, I would still call it a gauging that is non-invertible because it involves the non-invertible defects. And when you do get the two, when you do that, the two concepts do not agree. You can find an example in which you can do the gauging. What you find, and in fact, is not an SPT, is a TQFT. Uh, so, so the two cons, the two definition of anomaly do not agree. I see. So, slightly different. So, um, the result of yours is a necessary condition for the vanishing of the anomaly of the other uh, definition. Well, if you so if you restrict it uh, to the case in which uh, so the subgroup B is is is, is the full A, a then. Uh, you should, uh, so I have to think about it, but you should reproduce the fact that when there is no anomaly, you get a, there exists an SPT. Uh, but more generally, if you just gauge a subgroup of it, then you can have examples in which uh, uh, you can do the gauging, uh, but in the infrared, you have a TQFT that uh, supports okay, the, the symmetry as opposed to an SPT. I see, I see. Okay, thank you. Um, it was mentioned that there's this work by Douglas and Reuter on uh, spherical fusion two categories, which was further developed by Thibaut de Coupé. Um, these are all semi-simple two categories. Uh, and one question that I want to ask many people, including you now, um, is what are the physical reasons that you consider only these semi-simple uh, higher categories? Already one dimension low, it's possible to consider line defects that, yes, have, so, that are more uh, interesting than that. First part of the answer, you should not ask me, probably. <laughs> so, uh, but no, I mean, the, the, the reason to do that is that this is a simple uh, setup on which we have a better handle on. Uh, but for sure, it's not the most general situation, even, even, even in physics. So as I said, I'm restricting to cases in which you have a discrete and finite symmetry. And perhaps there are some extra conditions, the fact that the underlying category is semi-simple, but physically you can consider, and there have been constructed examples in, we are, in which we have more general symmetries that do not fall in that category. Um, plus, um, yeah, they are interesting. And Thank you. Interesting topics for research. I have a quick question. So in the talk, you're mostly mentioning the finite symmetries. What happens if you consider uh, continuous? Could you have some continuous non-inversible symmetry and study the, the whole anomaly of the continuous? Uh, uh, well, it's possible to have uh, continuous uh, non-inversible symmetries. For instance, uh, Antinucci, Rizzi, Galati had a, had a paper on it. Um, now, this. Those are more difficult to study. So physically, they tend to be more constrained theories, like free theories. So I don't know if you can have uh, an interacting theory where you have these continuous and invertible symmetries, but I don't see an obstruction to it. So I don't know what the answer is. Uh, mathematically, they are more difficult to study as, as well. Um, so I think that uh, this is an interesting question and should be studied. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much.